resume our hearing of September 9th. Um, Ms. Barraby, are you back? Yes, I am here. Um, next up, we have the University of Vermont Medical Center presentation. Great. And I believe, Kristen, are you able to share? Right, you know, I can probably. I can if you need me to. That's okay. I think I, hopefully my computer won't crash again by trying to share this PowerPoint. Um... Let me know if you can see my screen. Yes. Okay. Um, so this is just a note. I think we have this for other hospitals, but we received kind of a, a mid-process revised budget from UVMMC. Um, they submitted a budget and then notified us a few weeks later saying that they would like to increase their request. So you were communicated that and we shared all those materials, but that created a, a burden for staff to kind of reevaluate some key components of their budget. Um, so to summarize their ask, they requested for a 9.3% NPR increase. Um, so their NPR request is over $2 billion which represents 66% of the system now. Their commercial rate request was 6.8%, representing 62 million in additional funding. Um, and that represents 75% of the system-wide um, amount over guidance. Uh, the section three operating margin, they're shooting for almost 3% margin and that's around $69 million. Um, and so that is a substantial portion again of the system. So if we look at their justification for their budget request, a lot of this really leans on expanded access to care, which I think has been a theme and we've been talking about kind of some of the challenges in Vermont. Um, and so they argue that uh, NPR will help them continue to address the board's access concerns. Um, for example, in radiology capacity, e-consults for specialty care and refer back programs for primary care, and all of that will help address some of the backlogs that we've been experiencing. They also talk about high pharmaceutical expenses and revenues so that together will um, have an implication for, um, for their NPR growth. Um, they also discuss the cost shift. So um, as a reminder, that's kind of the underpayment um, or the theory of underpayment by um, government payers um, creates a necessity for higher commercial rates. They also say that they've managed their expenses very well. Um, they say that their clinical efficiency is quite high um, and that their admin to clinical ratio um, is low compared to uh, peers. They also um, discuss their cost reduction plan um, and believe that they have um, adhered to our request through the submission of that plan. They also note that they disagree with our regulatory approach. This was also included in their justification. So they disagree with the RAND commercial prices. Um, they disagree with our theory around market power. Um, and, they and they propose an alternative approach, which is to measure NPR growth as a per capita per covered life. Um, and so that there, this would reduce, in their mind, this would reduce their effective ask. This is not how we regulate hospitals and we don't have an apples to apples approach on a per capita basis, but we wanted to be transparent. Um, I did include, so they make this comment around uh, market power, but if you look at the Fitch ratings, it actually suggests um, that there's very limited competition. So despite some challenges that UVM had faced and kind of managing its expenses, um, that they thought that um, UVM still had a, an A rating and a stable outlook because of the lack of competition in their market. And we know that this is a, a key indicator of um, raising prices. So um, if we continue on and we can look at kind of trends by payer over time. Um, so you can see that in 2022, we see a real inflection point in the commercial revenue that they're receiving. Um, and this is quite substantial in comparison to the trend lines for both um, Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, 
Um, you should be used to seeing this slide now. This is about kind of over or under budgeting of particular payer revenue. Um, again, this is not to say this is there's an intent here, but just that there's this mechanics of budgeting that has implications for what the commercial rate request is. And I can kind of return to the net payer revenue analysis that we ask hospitals for each year. But really, the, the less that you model um, in your budget as it relates to Medicare and Medicaid, the more um, it looks like you need to raise your commercial revenues to cover growing expenses. So taken together, um, if you see consistently negative revenues on, on the commercial side and consistently positive uh, values on the Medicaid and Medicare side, you can kind of see how that might affect um, your rates over your rate requests over time or your revenue needs in the commercial market over time. Um, this is a history of their um, rates, their commercial effective rate. So to note the network hospitals have this other definition that we've been regulating um, them for a long time. I think until last year um, we switched and now everyone is following the same convention. Um, but, you know, so that goes up to 14.77% in 2023 and then it kind of comes back down, but you can see their total commercial NPR um, growing quite a bit um, over the 2022 and now to the 2025 um, period. If we look at their operating expense growth, um, you know, 2022 was a big year because they're still recovering from COVID. So that growth has come down a bit, but they're consistently, you know, in the um, 8.4 and 9.8. So these are these are not small numbers, but so operating expenses are growing um, quite a bit. Um, and then if you look at the breakout to the right, um, you know, we look at pharmaceuticals are certainly a major portion of that spending. Um, other services, other purchase services, um, and we know that labor is a major expense. So kind of the ratio of the spending hasn't shifted substantially, um, but certainly in magnitude, if you look on the left, it has grown quite a bit. If we look at where they're putting their um, their investments in, in FTEs, you can see that there is um, kind of an increase in proportion of clinical versus non-clinical FTEs in this year, um, though the distribution is, um, you know, still still like a third versus two thirds. Um, but they did, if you look at the largest investments by department, um, they did add 47 FTEs to their administrative non-clinical FTEs, 36 medical surgical. 33 to the medical group administration, clinical and medical group administration, non-clinical, um, pharmacy, clinical, FTEs, and fiscal services. So there's a lot of an admin kind of there at the top, and then you know some other, um, you know, medical, surgical, clinical, FTEs. Okay. If we look at their operating margin over time, we know that 2022 is a rough year for hospitals, but they've bounced back quite well. Um, if you look in 23, they're back to 3% and they've been around 3% operating margin for some time. Um, and so I think in their 25 requests, they're hoping to continue that trend. Um, you know, there's, there is substantial growth in expenditures um, in actuals over budget um, and then this translates into um, kind of a compounded effect over time. They are quite healthy. Um, you only see a little red here in 22. As I mentioned, that was a really challenging year for all hospitals. Um, you know, that's when the kind of COVID funding started drying up. Um, and you know, there were some challenges in that for non-operating revenue that affected their total margin, so the stock market. Um, but otherwise, they've seen very healthy margin across operating margin, total margin, EBITDA over time. We look at their day's cash on hand. Um, it looks like it's just over 100, but I think there were some questions during their hearing that led us to believe this may be underestimated. For example, their accounts receivable and some of the other kind of cash um, accounts on their balance sheet didn't seem to have any projections um, put on them. They were kind of held flat where other um, pieces of that um, metric were kind of moving. So there's perhaps some something missing, but it kind of shakes out, you know, it hovers around um, just over 100 days cash on hand. Um, their accounts receivable is really on the edge of um, average to poor, which means they're 
not collecting their bills as quickly as they perhaps um, maybe could. Um, their current ratio is well above, um, break even well above the US median, um, including the funded depreciation, as well as, you know, when you have, when you don't have the um, funded depreciation, it's still in, in the good range. Their age of plant um, is, is average. Um, so it's between the 25th and the 75th percentile. Um, Long-term debt to capitalization is under 30% generally. And so that's a, a good sign compared to industry average. Um, and then their debt service coverage ratio um, is higher than, than, necess higher than um, what is required for lenders. So, so in all, they have really stellar financial health um, as it, you know, as it relates to um, their financial health. When we look at prices, you, you probably have seen this slide a hundred times. We've all been talking about RAM data. Um, they are one of our most, they are our most expensive hospital. And there's probably good reason that they would be more expensive, but they are in the 10th decile um, nationally um, for many of our services. I understand there's some concerns with RAM data that the hospital has presented. I don't share those concerns, but I thought I'd offer another perspective. Um, we do this analysis every year. We take um, our APCD, our claims, um, and we, we estimate what the commercial reimbursement rates differentials would have been across payers, and we look at cost coverage, and this is posted to our website. Um, but you can see, looking on the left, this is the average patient uh, payment per inpatient discharge. And I'm sorry, that title should be inpatient and outpatient. Um, but you can see UVMs, this is adjusted. So for acuity um, is kind of one of the higher commercial, um, re receives one of the higher commercial reimbursements compared to the other hospitals on this chart, um, even after controlling for CMI. Um, and, you know, on outpatient, once you control for CMI, they're more middle of the road, but they're definitely top middle. So when you adjust for CMI, you're adjusting for how sick or how many services or how much coding is done. So it's still, you know, it, it doesn't translate directly to what people end up paying, but it's a relative kind of comparison that for this service, um, what we're, you know, what we're paying. So what were some of their assumptions for Medicare and Medicaid? They didn't, you know, describe this in detail in the narrative. So um, but what we do have is from the workbook. So it looks like from this workbook, they assumed a 6.6% increase for Medicaid, a 2.1% for Medicare, 3% for Medicare Advantage, and then 4.3% reimbursement growth for the all payer model FPP. And I'm wondering if some of that is due to case mix adjustment. I'm not sure given that the um, rates that, that Medicaid is um, assuming um, are, are not supposed to grow um, otherwise. That's just a, a hypothesis. I'm not sure that that's the case, but we could check. Um, so we wanted to present payer mix. So you'll notice that um, UVM has one of the most favorable payer mixes of any of our hospitals. So any spending in the commercial market has a substantial impact on what our rate payers pay. Um, and so they are represent about 72% of their revenues commercial versus 10.6 for Medicaid and 16.4 for Medicare. Um, their assumptions regarding volume are generally all pretty stable around 5%, um, you know, give or take across payers. And this looks at their commercial and public payer projected revenues. So, you know, because they are much larger, it's hard to kind of see the differences, but they do track generally um, over time. We look at their submitted versus their approved versus their actuals. Um, so this is looking at their NPR um, from 2020 to 2024, 25. So you'll see that where they were previously under in terms of actual, um, they started kind of getting back up to budgeted on in 2022. And then in 2023, that's when we kind of see um, NPR um, eclipsing what was um, approved. Similar for operating expense growth, um, you know, it previously was kind of tracking with revenues and now we're seeing kind of operating expenses outpacing um, approved and submitted. 
and their margins, as we mentioned, you know, with the exception of 2022, they're generally pretty um, robust. Um, a lot of um, hospital inflow, so a lot of uh, patients go to UVM. There are a lot of local, but also non-local, so they do serve a unique role in our healthcare system. You know, they're not just serving um, folks in Chinon County, but people from all over the state. So that is important to remember. Um, also for outpatient, inpatient, outpatient. Um, if we look at their summary, um, the efficiency summary, so 696, 697 clinical FTEs were reported of those, you know, 36.6% were below the 25th percentile, 80% were below the 50th percentile. So that is quite um, substantial. In terms of cost, um, they were lower than all Vermont comparator groups since 2020 for average inpatient costs per Medicare discharge, but significantly lower than other peer groups for all years. Um, hospital only cost per patient is 122% higher than peer groups and Medicare payment to cost ratio is 72%, while the peer median is at 103. But on the revenue side, um, we can see, you know, compound annual growth rate NPR per adjusted discharge is around 5.58% um, compared to the state total of 5.26%. So that's a little bit higher, um, but, you know, a little bit under national median, um, 6%. Their admin to clinical ratio um, is notably higher than the Vermont median, but it's around was around 31% in 2022. Um, and then their direct patient care FTEs were notably higher than comparator groups. And I, we can send you the details behind all of these um, as well and post those to the web. Um, we're trying to, as I think was mentioned in a previous, we have um, wanted to focus, but here is the motion language and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, thank you. I'll see if there's a second to a motion and then we can take board member questions or comments. Uh, I move to approve UVMMC's budget with modifications as follows. The fiscal year 25 NPR approved at a growth rate of not more than 3.5% over its fiscal year 24 approved budget, reduced from 9.3% and a commensurate reduction in operating expenses. With fiscal year 25 commercial change in charge, negotiated rate growth capped at 3.4%. Over the fiscal year 24 approved commercial rate cap reduced from 6.8% with no commercial rate increase for any payer exceeding that amount and subject to all other standard budget conditions as approved by this board. I'll second. Um, I don't have any questions or comments, but I did want to see um, one slide again, if that's okay, Ms. Barabee. Could you just go to 104? And just want to make a note. And then slide one oh eight, please. Um, Ms. Berby, I don't know if this came up in any other discussions with the medical center, but do you have any information about um, the drop in anesthesiologists? Um, not off the top of my head. I can go back and look and see if we can find them. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, any other board member comment or discussion? And I'll open it up to public comment. Dr. Leffler, how are you? Go ahead. Thank you, Chair Foster. Um, I want to start by acknowledging the extremely difficult situation that the Green Mountain Care Board is facing when it comes to controlling health care costs for Vermonters. We absolutely know there's a segment of the state right now covered by commercial insurance that is shouldering the bulk of medical inflation 
and this needs to change. We're aware and we want to help with that. But it's important that I'm very, very clear today that start sharp cuts to the UVM Medical Center, which is the state of Vermont's academic tertiary care hospital, will have long-term negative impacts on patients across our region, the medical center, Chittenden County, and all Vermonters. Over the last several years, we've been delivering more care to sicker people. People from across the state of Vermont every day need to be transferred to the medical center to receive care as well as, as, well as more people in Chittenden County needing our care. Our emergency department is over capacity almost every single day. Most days we have as many as 70 patients waiting for discharge to go to nursing homes that can't leave. On a daily basis, we have people needing to be transferred to the medical center that can't come when they need to because we don't have a bed for them. The budget that we presented for fiscal 25 represents what we need to care for the patients and not anything else, nothing more. We're seeing increased costs for drugs, increased costs for labor in other areas in our budget. Last year with the budget order, we made cuts to administrative services and there isn't much more we can do in those areas. We know we have work to do on improving access and we did a lot of improvement in access in 23, which I know we're gonna talk about. Um, and we need to work on productivity, which we're hard at work on making better. We have made progress, but we know we have to do more. We have patients now that can message our doctors through My Health, and we have e-consults and self-scheduling to improve access to our physicians, oftentimes at reduced cost for patients. In previous year's rate cuts, we've been able to manage around the edges and eliminate enough stuff to continue all current services. But I have to be completely clear that the budget cuts you're considering right now have to impact care for Vermonters, have to impact care for people in Chittenden County and across the state of Vermont. And things that we choose to have to stop will not be easy to restart again. I know we're going to talk about enforcement for 23. I just want to comment that 23 was all about improving them care and getting more access through the medical center. And the overage that we took in in NPR, we actually lost $23 million on that because we did it with by paying overtime, special pay, and using travelers. I want to make sure I say for the record that there are few places left to cut at the medical center and the impacts you will have will have to impact the clinical care that we can deliver. It'll have impacts on patients across our region and the most vulnerable runners will suffer the most. We want to be a partner in solving this. We want to improve affordability. We want to work on commercial insurance issues with you. But I'm gravely concerned these cuts will impact what we can deliver to our state. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Leffler, for sharing those thoughts. They're very important as we evaluate all of this. Um, other public comment via raise the hand. Okay, um, thank you. I'll turn it back to you, Ms. Barabee. Okay. So I won't go through all the details here. We've seen this before again earlier this spring, but this um, describes kind of the actuals versus what was budgeted over time. Um, for the University of Vermont Medical Center and shows that in FY23, they were 4.3% over, um, over on their NPR. Um, actuals to actuals, they were actually 8.4%. Um, so it's quite significant growth. Um, and you can look to the right um, to see how that affected their operating margin. Um, they ended the year with around 64 million. I believe the NPR was an overage of about 80 million. Um, and operating expenses, um, as um, Dr. Leffler mentioned, kind of were um, kind of tracking with NPR, um, with the exception of that margin. Um, and so I just, you know, I think I made this point, but I'll continue to make it so it's extra clear if anyone has questions. I mean, I think we need to be really um, thoughtful about how we budget and and think about the implications. And we're not always going to get it right, and there may be times to think about. Um, kind of adjusting going forward because um, we can't really go back and redo what we've already done. So um, I think I just wanted to make the point here that it's really important to A, have really um, 
thought about your expenses. I know, uh, Board Member Holmes, you've talked a lot about zero-based budgeting over the years and how important it is to get all those unnecessary costs out. And sometimes it, we have to start from scratch and really think about what's absolutely necessary. Um, I understand that is not a light lift, um, but particularly at this moment in time, that might be something to think about for hospitals that haven't done that or that's not part of their, um, their budgeting cycle. So expenses that top line cost inflation, this is the um, UVM's 2023 um, net payer revenue analysis. So that cost inflation, they take what their expected growth and expenditures are. Um, and so, and then they kind of work backwards and think about what they're gonna get paid by Medicare and Medicaid. Um, given the rates they know, we understand that that's been under budgeted over time. Um, we understand that some of the expenses kind of um, were over budgeted over time. And so I think you have to think about um, where we end up at the end of the year, kind of what that's actually representing. Um, and so that we determine those um, commercial rate growths as a function of those budget assumptions. So really understanding those budget assumptions and how they hold over time is really important. Um, so if we think about, and I think there are some of these are known, and I, I, you know, we've only scratched the surface here. I think, you know, I don't, I don't know UVM's budget as well as they do, so they know all the ins and outs and the timing. But based on um, the materials that they've submitted, these are just a couple examples of some of the over budgeting um, of expenses or under budgeting of operating revenues in FY23. So we talked about graduate medical education payments. Um, so there's a surplus of 30 million points, 30.7 million that we um, were unaware what unaware of and was not a part of their initial budget. Um, we see similar variances over time that amount to 53.2 million um, in FY22 and FY23 combined. Um, the Seoul Community Hospital status gave them an additional $9.5 million of revenue that was not included in their budget. Um, they over budgeted bad debt and free care by 33.3 million in FY23. Um, and that was around 60.61.6 million from FY21 to FY23. Um, we also understand that they have this owed from related third parties in the amount of 87.4 million, which was not part of their budget. Um, provider tax estimated at 8.6 million in variance um, from what they budgeted. That was around 14 million from FY21 to FY23. Um, they had 300, 340B revenues in the amount of 12.9 million that weren't included in their budget. Um, similar variations occurred from 21 to 23, amounting to a cumulative amount of 20.9 or almost 21 million. Um, grant income is another one. We love grants. We would hope that they get grants, but I would hope to see it in their budget. <laughs> Another four million in 2023 that wasn't accounted for, and uh, 15.8 million FY21 to FY23. Um, the COVID stimulus funding and other related grants were also excluded from their budget, 7.8 million, or around 121 million for FY21 to 23. Um, and then other operating revenue, um, 17.2 million in FY23, and I'm not, you know, I'm not sure what's exactly in that bucket, but um, that was about 32.5 million from FY21 to 23. So this is, I think it ends up being over $200 million if you just look at the 23 numbers. You know, of course, they're probably offsetting here and there, but there are some um, that were explicitly not budgeted um, that, you know, had a material effect on that previous calculation that I showed you that could um, kind of enhance the total amount of commercial revenue that they would say that they needed that perhaps and you know well, now that we're looking back at the actuals that because they were able to realize some of these revenues and because they didn't realize some of these expenses that they wouldn't actually need that total amount understanding that spending is continuing to grow um so you know, I think the other thing that I wanted to point out here is that, it, you know, there's there are a lot of materials um, and it's this is a really complicated process and we do our best to go through all the materials um, diligently and ask questions. Um, it's been really hard to get straight answers um, or answers that are easy for staff to follow. Um, I did request and follow up to the hearing on August 28th for more detail on FY23 over budgeting of expense, under budgeting. We had asked some very specific questions 
um, and they did not provide that detail in their submission. So I just, I, I would love to give you more information, but um, I had to kind of pull these out um, and I was not able to get that from the hospital. So in conclusion, um, the staff recommendation is for, for full enforcement on FY23. Um, uh, implemented through a commercial rate adjustment in FY25. Um, our rationale is because this overage, though due to unanticipated volume, and we do want to see access, um, but was also a result of significant over-budgeting of expense and under-budgeting of revenue. Um, we also noted um, through our various conversations their high prices and low productivity, so I think this kind of exacerbates this need for a high commercial price um, and and puts us unfortunately where we are today. So I know this isn't easy. Um, it's not fun to be up here and make this recommendation, but I think it's really important that we think about being very uh, frugal with Vermonters money, um, given the affordability crisis that is in front of us. So with that, I will turn it back to you, Chair Foster. Um, thank you, Ms. Barabee. Um, I will make the motion. Um, I move that we find that UVMMC's performance differed substantially from its fiscal year 23 budget. I move to deny UVMMC's application for retroactive adjustment of its fiscal year 23 budget. And I move to enforce this deviation by reducing the fiscal year 25 commercial change in charge and negotiated rate growth cap from 3.4 over the fiscal year 24 approved commercial rate cap to 5.4% under the fiscal year 24 approved commercial rate cap with no commercial rate increase for any payer exceeding that amount. Second. And board member discussion or questions? Um, I had just one. Ms. Barbie, you had a chart with, I didn't write down the slide. But the one I think it was titled over budgeting, under budgeting. I just want to make sure I understood it. So the bold number, the 30.7 for GME, that's the amount for fiscal year 23's budget. Yes. And then the next number you have 53.2. That's the aggregate of fiscal year 22 and 23. Yeah. So that's that's what was not in the budget, but then you know, came into actuals, right? So that's the variance from year to year. But yes, that is the, the bold number is the FY23 variance. And the number in the parentheses is the cumulative amount. Um, so this is, you know, a lot of these can understand one year, you don't get it quite right, but some of these are persistent multi-year um, budget challenges. Got it. And then on the GME, does you may not know this off the top of your head, um, but the 53.2, so in fiscal year 23, there was, I think it was around 11 million that the board reduced in its decision. Does this 53 include that board reduction? I would have to look at that. I don't, I can't, I don't want to do that math sure. off the top of my yeah, head. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no problem. Okay, thanks. Um, I'll open it up to public comment. Mr. Vincent. Good afternoon, uh, board members and staff. Um, actually, could we go back to slide 128 just for one minute? Uh, I just want to highlight one item on here. So the the amount owed from related parties, the 87.4 million, that's that's a balance sheet transaction. That's not an operating um, expense. So putting it in the same light as the other items on here, um, it's not it's not the same thing. Um, and then just a little bit about the the under budgeting or over budgeting of Medicare or Medicaid. I think one of the things that um, that I think I'm seeing is we're we're comparing rates with potentially patient mix changes. Um, and I think that obviously is another thing that we have to budget going into the year is how many patients do we think that we'll see for commercial Medicaid and uh, Medicare. So I think that also explains a, a part of the assumptions that um, that I think were, were being highlighted as potentially a rate um, difference when it's really um, when it's really a payer mix issue. Thank you. Thank you. 
any other public comment? Uh, Ms. Peakley, and I, I forgot to do this, but just for folks that are from a regulated entity. So Ms. Peakley, I recall you're the CFO of the medical center. Um, please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Chair Foster. Yeah. Um, I do want to address the um, comment regarding continually under budgeting or over budgeting. And I did put this in our follow up answers to specific questions that UVMMC as well as other members of the network budget based upon information that we know or based upon information that we can um, have a certain level of certainty. So the items that you see, so community hospital, you have significant amount of information on that about when that did become available to us and it was not available during our budget period. So that was not a known um, budgeting issue for us. Provider tax happens to be um, based upon revenue. So our actual certainly vary from our budget if our actual revenue does um, vary. We did provide a breakout showing that if you look at how patients actually came in and what we actually received by the payer mix, I would ask that you take another look at that to see that there was not a necessary burden based upon the commercial rate request that we had provided. So, and I would also ask if there is something, and, and I did send this an email, if there is something that is unclear or additional information that is needed so that we can make um, the most appropriate decisions. And I know that this is a, a lot for you all as the board to take in. It's a lot of information. We are more than happy to assist in that and was not aware that we had not complied with requests. So again, I thank you all for all of the information you have to go through. We are here to partner with you and provide any type of clarification that we can. Thank you all. Thank you. And I will just comment and note that you have provided a significant amount of information in a short period of time and follow up to a number of board member questions um, and staff questions. So, and I think that's all posted on our website. If there are things that are outstanding, we'll make sure we follow up. Um, obviously a tight turnaround here, but we'll we'll do that as well. So thank you. Any other public comment? Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Barabee, I'll turn it back to you. Actually, I think we have CVMC next. Yes. Um, so Dr. Merman, could you please excuse yourself? I will see you for Porter. Right. Thank you, we'll have some call you. Okay, can I have confirmation that um, Dr. Merman's left? Yes, he's no longer in the meeting. Okay. Um, okay, I'll be presenting on CVMC's budget today. Um, their NPR request was for 11.9% uh, growth. Um, that'd be $308 million, um, which would contribute to 14% of the system whole over guidance. Um, their commercial rate request was for 5.5% growth or $6.5 million. That would contribute to the 6% uh, over guidance. And for an operating margin, they requested to break even at 0.0% or around 0.0%. Next slide. So to justify their NPR and commercial rate requests, uh, they issued several justifications in their budget narrative and in their budget presentation. Um, they took similar issues with the board's approach that UVMMC uh, took. Um, they wrote that in their narrative, uh, so did Porter. Um, we haven't repeated that here um, just because Elena uh, covered them with UVMMC. Um, but they also issued these additional points. Um, one, they need to expand access. Uh, they claim that NPR will help them to continue to address the board's access concerns. Uh, they list several ways that they're expanding access. Um, and I apologize. Are the dogs in the background interfering with uh, with the presentation? <laughs> no, not even okay. hear them. 
Okay. Okay. You didn't need to out yourself, Noah. Oh, I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Next <laughs> year. Um, they list several ways they're trying to expand access uh, to radiology capacity, um, as um, they mentioned during public comment, e-consults for specialist care, a refer backs program for primary care, efforts to address certain backlogs, and uh, several other things they mentioned in the narrative. Uh, second, they said they have higher pharma revenues than past years, um, and they write that their pharma NPR is expected to increase by 3 million over the next year, which would compose about 13% of the total NPR increase. Uh, that's a figure they cite in their narrative. Uh, third justification, they say they've managed their expenses well. Um, they argue that their base expenses are reasonable, that their administrative cl to clinical ratio is uh, above median, and they argue that certain services are low, low cost. They provided the board data that they're low priced for radiology and certain commercial services, according to Clarify, which is a, a service that they use. So again, just keep these justifications in mind as we go over the data. Um, so this slide, again, shows actuals to budgeted NPR. Um, it shows they've mostly over budgeted their revenues in recent years. Actuals have come in less than uh, their budget. This is particularly true with um, their commercial revenues. Um, they over budgeted by about 13 million in 2022, about 21 million in 23. And uh, this really drove uh, a bottom line that was was over budget. Uh, by negative 4% in 22 and negative 6% in 23. Next slide. This shows their rate increases as well as cumulative NPR since 2018. Of uh, They've experienced uh, somewhat high rate growth um, above 2.3% since 2019. Um, if you look closely, you'll see 5.9%, then 7%, 8.7%, 12.5, and last year they received a 5% increase. This year they're requesting 5.5%. And the blue bars indicate the NPR growth over time, um, which again has uh, increased somewhat substantially over the last couple of years. Next slide. Uh, to dive into their expense trends, um, their operating expense growth has been um, uh, below the Vermont median for uh, most years. Uh, in 2022, 11.5%, then 4, then 4.9. Uh, 2025 is the first year they're projected to be above the median at 6.5%. Um, moving to the right, a breakdown of their expenses show that labor expenses are um, a relatively constant portion of their budget, decreasing slightly from 66 to 63%. Pharmaceuticals are increasing and um, other non salary expenses are increasing. Um, on the bottom right, you can see overages from their budget. They've consistently underpredicted the amount that they're spending on labor 10.6%, uh, 4.7%, and then 3.7%. And then they both over and underpredicted their, their pharmaceutical uh, expenditures. Uh, they plan to make several changes uh, to their labor pool and labor expenses this year. Um, they're budgeting to add 30 FTEs, uh, mostly in uh, non-clinical areas. Uh, as they mentioned to us when they submitted their budget, they just recently negotiated the contract for two collective bargaining units. Those are their registered nurses and tech professionals. And so that would immediately increase um, wages by seven, an average of 7% and increase them by an additional 13.5% over the next three years. Um, they also plan to increase staff and um, decrease traveler FTEs by about 16. Next slide. Um, this summarizes some of the data we have so far, um, their total revenues and expenses and how they sum up to an operating margin. Um, as you can see, they posted very negative operating margins in 2022 and 2023, um, mostly because of um, their operating expenses were greater than they predicted. Uh, this was negative 6.5% in both years, and then they are projected to break even this year, and uh, as I stated before, are requesting to uh, break even for next year. Uh, going to the right, you can see um, how much they've uh, first, over predicted their revenue 
So they overpredicted their revenue by negative 2% and then negative 5% in 2022 and 2023. And then they underpredicted their operating expense by um, 6% in 2022. Again, a difficult year for all the hospitals. And then 2.2% and are projecting 3.9% uh, for this year. And that all sums up to what have been pretty negative operating margins. Next slide. Um, these are their operating and total margins as well as EBITDA over the last few years. Um, we see a lot of red in this graph. Uh, as I stated before, operating expenses higher than what they budgeted. Um, so they had uh, negative operating margins and total margins even more negative, um, drove them more into the red. Um, this year, they're projected to look healthier, um, but their 25 budget would sort of plateau again, hovering above the 0% line. Next slide. These are graphs of their day's cash on hand and PAR. Uh, their day's cash on hand is low. It hasn't been on above 100 since at least 2022. Um, however, it's uh, difficult to, we talked about this during the budget hearing, uh, sometimes difficult to estimate their exact day's cash on hand because they're part of the network. So um, it's difficult to understand how much cash is held at CVMC versus other network hospitals. Um, their PAR used to be poor. Um, it's improving um, and is now in the average range. So it shows they're uh, increasing the pace of their cash flow. Next slide. Uh, this is their current ratio with funded depreciation as well as without funded depreciation. Um, you can see they're um, below the US median, but um, above breaking even with funded depreciation. Without funded depreciation, their current ratio is is lower um, and uh, slowly decreasing over time. Um, this is uh, just as a reminder. Um, this, sorry, I'm looking at my notes right now. Um, this also indicates they have a significant amount of funded depreciation, which is particularly important for hospitals with an older age of plant. Um, so the next slide speaks to that, uh, CVMC's age of plant which is above the 75th percentile um, and increasing. So overall, we say it's good that they have funded depreciation to cover this. Um, in general, the older age of plant, the greater need for uh, capital resources in the short term. Uh, so we'd also like to see a higher day's cash on hand as well. Next slide. Uh, final two financial health metrics, long-term debt to capitalization and debt service coverage ratio. Uh, their long-term debt to capitalization is uh, very low compared to other Vermont hospitals. Sometimes it's hard to see on the y-axis with perspective, but um, they've been below 14, below 12% since 2022, and are budgeting to be around 6% in 2025. Their debt service coverage ratio um, was in the negative in 2022 and 2023, um, but is projected to increase substantially this year and should be well above the minimum, minimum ratio for next year. Minimum ratio is 1.25 to 1.4. They're projecting to be around four. Next slide. So a summary of their financial health indicators, a mixed, uh, a mixed bag here. Uh, their margins have been low, they've recovered, but they're budgeted to be pretty low um, in 2025. Uh, their day's cash on hand is also low, but hard to determine the metrics accuracy due to the cash flow within the UVM network. Um, PAR uh, was poor, but it's improved to average performance over the last two years. A uh, current ratio is below one without unrestricted funded depreciation. Uh, their age of plant is old. It's above the 75th percentile, um, but their long-term debt to capitalization and debt service coverage ratios are um, healthier and, and less concerning. Next slide. Um, RAN price data, um, if you're looking at the right, uh, this is the best estimate of their um, overall price. Um, high price decile for outpatient services, they're in the seventh decile, and then a relatively lower for uh, inpatient and inpatient facility as well as outpatient facility, they're in the fourth decile. Um, and then their uh, relative price is higher, which again suggests that they're reimbursed less favorably um, by Medicare compared to critical access hospitals. Next slide. 
Uh, now to delve into their budget assumptions. Um, we asked what they assumed would be their reimbursements for Medicare and Medicaid this year. Uh, they didn't just um, cite a specific uh, increase in their narrative, but from their workbook, we extrapolated that they're expecting 0.4% for Medicaid and 0.4% for Medicare. Next slide. Uh, their volume assumptions. Um, so like many Vermont hospitals we reviewed so far, their payer mix is around 60% commercial, 61% commercial. They're 26% Medicare um, and about 12% Medicaid. Um, they're expecting pretty significant increases to their volume, to their utilization this year, um, particularly in uh, among commercial payers and uh, Medicare Advantage, commercial uh, beneficiaries and Medicare Advantage beneficiaries. And they attribute about 8.5% of their total 11.9% NPR increase just to increased utilization. Next slide. Um, this shows their projected uh, NPR to their budgeted NPR. Um, overall, they've been very closely aligned, uh, especially in 2022 and 2023. So um, nothing really of mention here. Next slide. Uh, to go over their budget history, uh, the boards approved their NPR request in 2022 and 2023, but adjusted um, for other years. The boards approved their operating expenses for 2020 and 2023, but adjusted in other years. Um, generally, as I stated before, they've over budgeted revenues. Revenues have come in below what they expected and they've under budgeted expenses. So expenses have come in above what they expected. Um, the boards also approved their operating margins in 2021 and 2023, adjusted in other years. But as we stated before, their operating margins have been uh, much more negative than we anticipated uh, in the recent past. Next slide. Um, to summarize their sorry, aggregate of efficiency metrics, uh, they reported about 106 clinical FTEs to us. Of these 106, 40.7% uh, were below the 25th percentile, um, but around 60% were below the 50th percentile. Um, cost is a mixed bag. Um, they're slightly lower than Vermont comparator groups. Um, but higher than peer groups for their average inpatient cost per Medicare discharge. Um, revenue has been very high over recent history. Um, their NPR per discharge is well above the peer group median. Compound annual growth rate of NPR um, from 2018 to 2022 is 11.4% uh, compared to uh, comparable Vermont total, which is just 5.3%. Um, their admin to clinical ratio varied year over year. Um, but uh, was about the same as the Vermont median, a little below the Vermont PPS median of the last year reporting, which was 2022. And direct patient care FTEs generally lower than the Vermont median until 2022 when it cropped up higher. Um, it's consistently higher than, than their peer groups. So uh, just to summarize, their main justifications, uh, their need to expand access, high pharmaceutical revenues, low cost for certain services, and they claim that they've managed their expense as well. And with that, I'll pass it on to either Owen or Elena to uh, take comment, questions, and to read the uh, motion uh, language. Thank you very much. Um, I will make the motion and ask for comment. Um, I move to approve CVMC's budget with modifications as follows. Fiscal year with fiscal year 25 NPR approved at a growth rate of not more than 6% over its fiscal year 24 approved budget reduced from 11.9% and a commensurate reduction in operating expenses. With fiscal year 25 commercial change in charge negotiated rate growth capped at 3.4% over the fiscal year 24 approved commercial rate cap reduced from 5.5% with no commercial rate increase for any payer exceeding that amount and subject to all other standard budget conditions as approved by this board. Any board member comment or questions for staff? Did you want to ask for a second first, or I can go oh. ahead with my comment? <laughs> sorry, sorry, Robin. I I'm going through so many of these. I apologize. Yes, yes we. No, no, no worries. And 
motion space here. Uh, yes, please. If there's a second, that'd be great. I'll second. All right, thank you. And member Lund, if you had a comment or question. Yes, um, I'm concerned with the staff recommendation for CVMC because when I look at where they're coming in for fiscal year 24 projected and then I add in the price recommendation, um, it would act in order for them to stay on budget, they would need to decrease volume in the amount of 4 million. Um, so the numbers aren't quite adding up for me. So I just wanted to put that comment out there. Thank you. Any other board member questions or comments? I'll make, yeah. I'll make one, although I realized I seconded, but uh, when we deliberate, I'd like to understand better um, how you arrived at the 6% for the growth rate um, rather than uh, guidance. The, the the rationale for that didn't jump out at me with the presentation. Okay. Yeah, I think the the growth rate here is because they are seeing some volume increase. Um, but I can get you more details on that on our assumptions in my modeling spreadsheet. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think it's just the three of us right now. I believe. Dr. Merman's out and member Holmes had to step out, but we'll watch this video later. Um, so I'll open it to public comment via raise the hand. Um, Ms. Noonan, uh, the CEO of CVMC, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity, Chair Foster, to speak during the board's deliberations. CVMC's NPR growth is a direct result of our focus to improve patient access. As a reminder, CVMC's submitted budget also includes Woodridge rehabilitation and nursing facilities. Their inclusion skews our financial metrics when comparing our organization to our peers. Our FY25 budget and rate increases were determined after months of careful planning and were made with the goal of continuing to meet the needs of our healthcare, um, healthcare needs of our community um, that we serve. So for the record, I respectfully ask that the board does not reduce our NPR or commercial rate requests from our original submission. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much for attending and for participating, Ms. Noonan, um, and for your team's presentation to the board. Uh, any other public comment? Okay. Um, why don't we take a six minute break so that we can get Dr. Merman back and then we'll turn to the last hospital for staff presentation, which is Porter. So we'll come back at 1.15 and Michelle, we can go off the record. Okay, we're off the record. Okay, we're back on the record. Okay, we'll resume our hearing of September 9th and I'll turn it to Ms. Barabee for the presentation on Porter Hospital. I think we'll have a staff who's oh, Emma, right? I will share screen. Okay, great. Um, I'll just jump right into Porter. <clears throat> so we they suggest or submitted a 4.2% NPR request, which is about 1% of the system over guidance. And that was also obviously over the benchmark of 3.5%. Their commercial rate request came in under benchmark at 2.5%. So it's about negative 1% of the system over guidance. And overall, their operating margins at 4.7%, which is 6% of the system as a whole. So looking at their hospital justifications, um, we see similar things across the UVM Health Network hospitals, but they do talk about a need to expand access to certain services and claim that this uh, in increased NPR will help them to continue to address uh, access concerns. And they also note they have high pharma revenues. In their narrative, they wrote that pharma NPR is expected to increase about $2.8 million, which composes well over 100% of the total NPR increase, and this is pre-rate change.
Looking at their commercial effective rate, we see that from 2018 to 2022, this was pretty stable between 2.6 and 4%. However, we see, like in, with many other hospitals, a jump in 23 up to 11.5%. Um, and this is in, particularly important for Porter uh, since they are subject to potential enforcement, and that is for the fiscal year of 23. So it seems that they got a rate that was potentially higher than what they may have needed. Looking at expense trends, we see that expense growth for Porter has been slightly above the Vermont state average with the exception of 2022. And it seems to be relatively flat between 24 and 25, around 7.8 or 7.9% growth. Looking at overall their expense, their top expenses as a percentage of their total operating expense, we see that the main one is labor. They've got it broken out pretty uh, significantly here. And so we're going to focus on labor and pharmaceuticals, considering that that's a pretty large portion of their justification. So looking at their labor, historically, this has been underestimated against actuals, where we see that change in 2024, uh, which is projected to be under budget by about 7.9%. And for 25 overall, they're projected to increase labor by 17.4%. For their pharmaceuticals, uh, Porter speaks to the inflation factor for pharmaceuticals being 4%, but we see that comparing their actuals to budget, they have pretty significant increases over that budget. So 25.3% in 22, 22.3% in 23, and up to 39.1% in 24. However, from their income and expense, their projected 24 to their budgeted 25 is expected to decrease by about 10%, which we see in that bottom uh, graph or that bottom chart there. Looking at uh, labor specifically, we see that their clinical, non clinical budgeted split is 66% clinical, 34% non clinical. However, when we look at their distribution of additional budgeted FTEs, we see that just 43% of those are clinical, while 57% are non clinical. And looking at that chart on the right, we can kind of see that their top two changes are housekeeping and dietary, both non clinical FTEs. And in total, that's accounting for 12 additional. In their narrative, they talk about how they hired 17 of their target 18 inpatient nurses to reduce their reliance on travelers, which is good. Uh, and they also successfully negotiated a contract for the first two collective bargaining units, which Noah already talked about in CVMC, so I will uh, skip over that. Looking at their operating margin growth, uh, Porter's been able to maintain a positive operating margin since 22, um, and that's continuing to, for projected in 24. And this has been above the Vermont total operating margin each year. In the narrative, they state that they've had a reduction in orthopedic, orthopedic cases in the OR due to the retirement of an orthopedic surgeon. So we see that that has had a negative impact on GPSR and NPR um, from both the volume and the case mix standpoint. However, they are hoping to continue a strong 4.7% operating margin budgeted for 25 so if we look over to the right uh, at the operating revenue, we see that they typically have been under budgeting by over 3%. However, again, due to this OR reduction, we see that in 24, it's projected to be uh, to come under at about negative 3.5%. We see the same thing with operating expenses generally in 22 and 23, it was over 7%, but this has dropped down to essentially even just over at 0.1% over. So year over year, Porter Hospital has been able to maintain margins above 3%, and they seem to hope to continue to have this trend in 2025. So again, looking at margins, we see that there's only one single non-positive value here. Um, overall, we see FY24 projected has both operating and total margin in the green. Uh, and we would like to see that continue as well as budgeted for 25. Porter has some of the highest margins in the state. As we saw on the last slide, they're all consistently over the average, but in general, they're also just as on their own higher than most of the state. So no concerns with their uh, margins here. So looking at their day's cash on hand, we see that it has kind of fluctuated a little bit between about 100 and 120 in the last three years um, and budgeted for 25 has dipped to below 100. Again, it can be difficult to know exactly where they stand due to the cash flow within the network and, and this being a snapshot in time. Um, so overall, we'd like to see it increase, but we don't really know if, if this is a true representation of Porter's day's cash on hand. Looking at their days in patient account receivable, we see that they have uh, moved down to about average, but it is kind of fluctuating in that average to poor performance. So there's definitely room for improvement for Porter in this regard. 
looking at their current ratio, so we see on the right without that funded depreciation, they are above both the break even of one and the US median. Uh, and then on the left, we see that they have a good, it appears that they have a good amount of funded depreciation as well, um, which makes them significantly even more high than the US median and the break even here. So we can look next at Porter's age of plant. So what we see is that in they've been they Porter has gone from being above the 20 or the 75th percentile in 2022 down to below the 25th percentile. So assuming that this is uh, reflective of, of actual age of plant for Porter, then this is a really a huge improvement and, and a big positive for Porter. Looking at their long-term debt to capitalization, we see in the last three years, they've been below 15% and that number continues to decrease. So there's no concerns there, as well as looking at their debt service coverage ratio, they're consistently well above that standard minimum ratio for lenders. Um, so again, overall, no concerns with Porter on these, on these metrics. So this summary, um, Porter's margins are among the highest in the state. Their day's cash on hand is around or just above 100, but again, difficult to tell exactly due to cash flow within the network. Their day's inpatient account receivable has average performance, but it is kind of hovering on that average to poor, so we'd like to see that continue to improve. But besides that, there's no concerns. Their current ratio is solid with and without uh, unrestricted funded depreciation. Their age of plants decreased from above the 75th percentile to below the 25th percentile. Uh, and their long-term debt decapitalization and their debt service coverage ratio are both good. So overall, uh, no concerns with Porter. Switching gears and looking at their price, we would consider Porter to be average price. Again, we see a slight increase um, in the outpatient, but overall this is probably on the low to average for Vermont specifically. Um, and again, we do see that that relative price is lower in almost all cases compared to standardized price, which would again make sense given that Porter is a critical access hospital and are likely reimbursed pretty well for their Medicare patients. Looking at their public payer prices and their assumptions for Medicare and Medicaid, again, not a super clear percent increase or answer to this in their narrative, but pulling from their workbook, we pulled a 0% increase for Medicaid and a 3.7% increase for Medicare. Looking at their payer mix, they come in just below 63% commercial, making that their largest uh, payer followed by Medic traditional Medicare as well as Medicare Advantage just below 28%, and then Medicaid is just over 9%. For their changes to their volume or utilization, their largest increases are in Medicare Advantage and commercial, um, but still moderate increases as well in traditional Medicare as well as Medicaid. And overall, this attributable, and attributable NPR increase is 6.2%. Uh, Porter did request an NPR increase overall of 4.2%, so this discrepancy uh, may be due to the fact that they do have some payer mix shifts, so that could cause that NPR overall to go down, but just the theory, we're not 100% sure. Looking at their projected versus their actual NPR, starting with the commercial projected, we see overall it's pretty close to what they actually come into, a little bit under, or excuse me, their actuals came in a little over in 21 and maybe slightly under in 23, but overall it's pretty close. Um, for public payers, we see a little bit of a larger distance, so the actuals came in a good bit over in 21, but that gap does seem to be closing between 22 and 23, coming in slightly under both years. Looking at their budget history, what we see is that across all three of these, the board has approved their NPR, their operating expenses, and their operating margin between 2020 and 2023. And then in 2024, it was adjusted uh, for each of these. And then overall, their um, actuals have come in over for operating margin with the exception of 2022. Finally, looking at efficiency for Porter, they had for clinical productivity, 66.6 .6 clinical FTEs were reported. 34.3% of these were below the 25th percentile and 77.9% were below the 50th percentile. So definitely room for improvement for productivity. Uh, for costs, they were lower than their Vermont comparator groups for the average inpatient cost per Medicare discharge from 2018 to 2021. However, in 22, it's pretty comparable. Their costs overall are consistently lower than their peer group. 
For revenue, their compound annual growth rate of NPR per adjusted discharge from 2018 to 2022 is 3.27%, um, but comparing this to the Vermont total of 4.35% and the national median of 5.66%, they do come in a little under both of those uh, averages or, or medians. And then finally, for their admin to clinical salary ratio, they're generally lower or at least comparable from year to year to, comp to their comparator groups. And they were much lower in the most recent year of data of 2022 at 13.6%. And that wraps um, Porter. So I'll turn it back to you, Chair Foster. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, I move to approve Porter Medical Center's budget with modifications as follows. The fiscal year 25 MPR approved at a growth rate of not more than 3.5% over its fiscal year 24 approved budget, reduced from 4.2%, and a commensurate reduction in operating expenses. With fiscal year 25 commercial change in charge and negotiated rate growth capped at 2.5% over the fiscal year 24 approved commercial rate cap, with no commercial rate increase for any payer exceeding that amount, and subject to all other standard budget conditions as approved by this board. Second. Board member comments or questions for staff? On Porter, and, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Robin. Um, I have a, I'm a little bit concerned that they're 24 projection is coming in so far below um, budget. And I certainly understand the ortho departure would influence that. I'm wondering if it would influence that quite that much, because if you look at the projection to the NPR recommendation, it's an 8% increase. So that seems significant. And I'm a little concerned about um adding too much room there um just in terms of ensuring the healthy margin so just something i'm thinking about i wanted to say out loud any other board member comments or questions Okay, I'll open up for public comment on the motion that's proposed for Porter. Um, Mr. Ortmeyer, how are you? Great, Chair Foster. Thank you. How are you doing? Okay, so uh, Chair Foster, thank you. And I appreciate the opportunity here to, to uh, comment. Uh, really, at the end of the day, this budget for 25 is about uh, meeting the need for our patient care in our community for this next year. We want to ensure that our ability to care for our people depends, you know, upon our services here. Um, our costs are rising, as you've heard, it's pharmaceuticals, it's our workforce. The workforce is a fixed cost through our increased uh, uh, bargaining units that we have. We've just finished that and it's, it ends up being more than budgeted, so it's a real cost. The impact is real on us and, you know, it's really critical uh, to our ability to be successful. We've been reducing costs effectively, as you heard during our hearing uh, this past year, and we'll continue to do so. Our budget includes also the financial coverage of Helen Porter nurse, Nursing Facility that otherwise wouldn't exist, and we all know the challenges with appropriate placements for our growing elderly population. We're working hard on access, uh, which is reflected in the 23 results as well as our 25 budget, uh, but these reductions will cut into the core of our clinical services. You've heard the concerns from Dr. Leffler and, and Anna Noonan. Uh, I echo all their concerns, so I don't need to repeat them. Um, but Porter relies on both of these hospitals for the next level of care, which we really utilize on a daily basis. So cutting their services uh, impacts the residents of Addison County as well. I hope that's all taken into consideration uh, for a final ruling. So um, that's all. So back to you, Chair Foster. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and you're not sworn in. You don't have to answer any questions or anything like that. But I, I did have one or two, if you don't mind. And if you want to get back to me, totally sure. fine. Um, just they're just on my head. Um, fiscal year 23, there's an overage. We'll talk about that, I think, next. Fiscal year 24, it looked like the data we had was through June. How's the rest of fiscal year 24 looking? Uh, pretty much uh, a continuation of where we have been. Um, we have no new providers starting till right at the end of this month. 
So it's uh, inpatient um, has been the same as what it's been. Our expenses have been stable to where they are. So um, really, really project out from June. You'll you'll see it's it's about the same. Okay, great. All right, thank you. Any other public comment on the Porter motion? Okay, Ms. Barabee, I'll turn it back to you or your staff. Yes, okay. Um, so this is um, still Porter, it's the enforcement slides. Again, this should be familiar. Um, so in FY23, they came in 7.8% over budget. Um, and I think this was about $11 million, and that was about 8.5% over their prior year actuals. Um, and actually, you can go back to the other side. So that resulted in a $9 million margin in FY23. Um, the recommendation, as um, you're aware from last week, is for partial enforcement, 50% of NPR over budget, implemented through a downward adjustment to commercial rate in FY25. Um, this overage was primarily due to unanticipated volume. So as we've been discussing, we want to see more access, but if we don't need to offer price in lieu of, of access, we really need to think about recalibrating moving forward, um, particularly when these volume trends are expected to keep continuing into the future, um, we would expect an economies of scale over time. So according to MedPAC, um, as we spoke about earlier, this is the same statement, but I just wanna bring it back up. Um, an efficient hospital typically has a cost structure where 70% of the costs are considered fixed in the short term with 30% being variable. Um, this would mean that enforcement for an efficient hospital would recover that fixed cost of 70%. Here we're saying we would recover 50, so it's actually quite generous compared to the assumptions around an efficient hospital. Um, and so that is the staff recommendation. Is there a proposed motion language for the enforcement? Okay, thank you. Um, I move that we find that Porter Hospital's performance differed substantially from its fiscal year 23 budget. I move to deny Porter's Hospital, Porter Hospital's application for retroactive adjustment of its fiscal year 23 budget and move to enforce this deviation by reducing the fiscal year 25 commercial change in charge and negotiated rate growth cap from 2.5% over the fiscal year 24 approved commercial rate cap to 8.9% under the fiscal year 24 approved commercial rate cap with no commercial rate increase for any payer exceeding that amount. Second. Board member comment and discussion. And just for the record, I'm recognizing that there may be more comment or discussion as we try and uh, actually make the votes on these later this week. So certainly looking forward to additional feedback from any public commenters that can help um, our thinking on these important issues. And with that, I'll turn it to public comment. Mr. Del Treco. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. I was a little slow there uh, figuring out my mute, believe it or not. Um, so, so thanks. I, I want to. Um, explore uh, three types, three comments, uh, and some are related. Um, the, the first is, again, around volume and price um, as it relates to NPR, um, as well as the standard orders, I think, B and C. Um, uh, your staff person, Mark, did a nice job explaining the new paragraph C, um, how it's specific to rate. I'm just curious is how volume plays into these conversations um, and does it or does it not? Is it aggregate? Um, uh, so question number one. Um, question number two as it relates uh, to volume and price. I still remain deeply concerned that we're not breaking down um, the drivers of 
uh, NPR around price or the charge master amounts and volume. I know you heard from a couple of hospitals today, and I'll share again that um, I think we are all in line with how we want to improve access, and we agree um, in that space. Um, I've spoken to it, hospitals have spoken to it, the board has uh, spoken to it, and if volume is increasing and NPR is uh, goes up as a result of it, how is that being seen as uh, negative if we're improving access? And I'm carefully using the word negative. I, I, I understood earlier in the week that we called it penalty, and that might not have been a, a, a word that was um, well received. But but our hospitals are on the um, as we look, and I think a much a big part of this is around volume and that volume is people showing up uh the demand is increasing and i'm i'm curious how we balance the expense side of the equ equation with the volume side by just taking away and i understand the challenges we're having and then the third area and i and i shared and sent you some information uh, per your request from earlier this morning it's unclear to me if the two years off of 22 actual or 22 budget um after the 23 guidance was set, uh, there were a couple of changes that addressed 22 um, as being the, as 22 actuals being the base in which we were anchoring um, the two year rate increase to. So it's a little unclear to me what's being used and why. And, and I would just remind the, the board and, and, and the public, members of the public, the reason why the 22 actual conversation happened was because of the great uncertainty in predicting budgeted volumes, budgeted increases, and a lot of time was spent by the board uh, reviewing that. So I, I respectfully ask that we don't for, forget about that as we take into consideration enforcement as well as uh, moving forward in this 25 budget space. I just don't think that level of predictability is is back um, in 25 and I have I wish we had a crystal ball to say volume and utilization would be doing X, Y, or Z, but it's, it's a, as you all know, it's a pretty tricky business. So uh, those three areas, I think, are um, uh, areas that I'd like to get more clarity on. And, and then the final related to that is uh, slide eight. I really don't know what slide eight is doing. Um, and uh, I, I, I've tried to do the math a couple of times now, and I just don't think all the pieces and parts are there. So maybe it doesn't have to be today, but I think walking through that in a more complete way, um, validating whether we're off 22 budget or 22 actual, uh, and then um, so I can understand the components of that. It's not clear to me if if it's total growth or enforcement is in there. So there's a lot of moving pieces and parts and it's complex and I can appreciate that. So so thank you for that. I'm happy to clarify that now. So we're all on the same page. And I think um, sure. the, po the point, the 8.6 is, as I mentioned, a point of comparison. Everything in this analysis is based on what was in the budget order. So that is the piece that matters. So the board at that point in time had made a decision on what the FY23 budget would be based on all the factors you just discussed. That's what those growth rates are in the spreadsheet above. I brought up the 8.6 to remind people what the goal was at that point in time over those two years. So these growth rates you're seeing are relative to the legal document, the budget order. So FY23 budget, all the labels are at the top. So I can happy to give you the spreadsheet so you have the calculations, but it's, um, the 8.6 again. Yeah. The, yeah. I'm particularly yeah. interested in the, I don't know, no, I don't know what rec means. Um, recommendation. So the staff recommendation and how that compares, right? So I think the request was from board member lunch to look at how the staff recommendation compared to the FY24 projected. So I did that, but I thought it was helpful to have kind of the history um, in comparison. But again, I'm happy to provide the spreadsheet so you can that'd see be, my exact formulas. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the FY24 projected and the 22 budget. I do think um, based on, and I, I could call it, pull it up on my screen if, it, if it's helpful. 
it's uncertain to me if it's actual or budget, and I think it matters um, because right. I think I have I put budget here, so I was comparing to the budget. I can also compare the actual. That's not the amount we're enforcing. The amount that's in enforcement is relative to the budget. So this is just to look at trends and understand growth over time. So I just want to be mm -hmm. very clear about what this analysis is and isn't. Yeah. It's not the enforcement amount. It is to look at trends and understand growth rates. The enforcement amount is based on what was included in that year's budget, which is based on the actuals that you were describing. I'm taking the enforcement amounts straight from what hospitals were held accountable to in that year. Is it fiscal year 22 budget or fiscal year 22 actual? And we can, I don't we need to do this over here on this. It's the budget talk. order. So it's what the order says, but I'm happy to point you to that. How does the, how does the, the moving, um, when, we, when 23, um, uh, when 24 guidance was set, and I don't have all the data points in front of me here, but uh, there was a very contemplative process with the board where um, where the, the the anchor was switched to fiscal year 22. Um, so that's reflected and, in the FY23 budget, right? So the FY23 budget column is uh, what the board decided at that time. I don't know if that's right. That's why I'm asking. So from the 24 budget orders we there was a contemplative process to move to the two years to fiscal year 22 actual and in the um uh and you know that there's some introductions and notable changes where it states that fiscal year 24 budget shall use 22 actual actuals and it goes on to explain the two years. So I don't know what's right, and it's confusing whether it's budget or actual because of so some of these changes after the fact. No, that's fair. I'm wondering if Mark could help clarify the difference between guidance and a budget order, because I think that's where this confusion is happening. Um, well, and, and um, I think two items. So one is I would be more than happy to speak offline with counsel for any of the hospitals or for VAS to talk over any discrepancy or confusion that's perceived. I think that would be the most appropriate way to kind of deal with the, um, you know, it, maybe the most appropriate way for me to involve myself. Sure. But but with that in mind, um, to the extent it's useful, when we are talking about enforcement, just to have this info available to the public when we are talking about enforcement we are talking about any uh deviation from a budget order and i th i think that point has been made but but that's the only thing that maybe i'll, I'll add here at this point mm -hmm. yeah and, I mean, and in the i just in interrupt because i i want to make sure we move on so uh, there is a little bit of uh, mr del Trucco, i know you you will but just send us in a letter um what exactly the concern is i took away from this slide maybe i took away something that you were taking away different, but it's to give us information directionally as to just see over time how much the NPR growth has been from budget to budget from 23 to 24 to uh, not 25, but just to see that magnitude and to get a sense of it, which I think your point is some of this is volume. Yes. Some of it's price. Yes. But that, that to me is all I was taking away. It was just sort of a, uh, a fact of where these budgets were compared to prior years' budgets. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. I, yeah, the intent is, I don't know what the intent is. And I do think, um, Mark, thank you for your offer. I think that will be, that will be helpful. Great. Um, I think we had, um, member Lunch, were you able to connect with Mark? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so can we put back up the standard conditions and maybe Mark, you could walk us through any changes or modifications since we saw it earlier today? Yeah, I'm happy to. I'm going to pull this up myself because I just have these on my on my own here. So let me just grab those. All right, you should be able to see that. Um, I'll note a new color, 
we're almost halfway to a rainbow, it looks like. So the new color is purple. And purple represents changes I've made since this morning to right now. And there's just one of them. So this will be brief. The change uh, is item D. And that change is as follows. The, the commercial negotiated rate cap in paragraph B, which again is the one that sets the uh, change in charge and negotiated rate increase cap. The commercial negotiated rate cap in paragraph B shall not apply to Medicare Advantage plans. That was the request uh, from member Lunge. All other budget order uh, standard conditions remain the same unchanged from this morning. So that's, that's the extent. And what I'm gonna do is just click right over to the standard budget proposed motion language, which if taken up today, like the other motions would be tabled for a vote on um, the 11th or on the 13th. And I'm happy to speak to that request if that would be helpful in terms of adding some context. Um, and I did have one other suggestion that I made to Mark that we kind of went back and forth on that I'd like to just speak to regardless of whether or not other folks want to make it. Sure, that would be, that'd be great. Great. Mark, would you mind going back? Thank you. Um, so in terms of the Medicare Advantage plans, Medicare Advantage plans are typically categorized as commercial plans. In some of the staff recommendations have a commercial rate percentage increase that is potentially less than the Medicare increase, which is what drives the Medicare Advantage. And so I did not think that the intent was to limit um, Medicare revenue, which Medicare Advantage, despite being categorized as commercial, is Medicare revenue. So um, that's why I had suggested D, just to ensure that there wasn't that unintended, what I thought was an unintended consequence. Um, the other thing that language suggestion that Mark and I went back and forth on is there the change in charge or the charge master. There is one charge master. There's not a commercial charge master separate from the overall charge master. So I find it confusing to refer to the commercial change in charge because it's actually the overall change in charge because it changes the charge master. And hospitals can't have multiple charge masters. They can only have one. So I think a cleanup would be to revert that language to last year's condition, which was overall change in charge, distinguished from a commercial negotiated rate increase. That's a bit of a pain because we've included this language in every single motion. So there will be need to be an amendment for every single motion on that language. So that's sort of the downside is the procedural uh, annoyance of the thing. But I think to be technically accurate, we would refer to an overall change in charge and a commercial negotiated rate increase. So I'm just putting it out there because I think that, that it would, from my perspective, I'd rather be technically accurate um, even though recognizing it's going to be a bit of a annoying procedural cleanup. Any other board member comment or discussion? Um, Robin brings up some interesting points. I, um, in regard to Medicare Advantage, um, I'm wondering how many hospitals her concern may apply to and how much difference that would make. Her concern, if I got it right, Robin, that um, the cap that we're placing on um, commercial price increase, the worry is that Medicare may have a bigger price increase. And so I'm wondering, is is that happening with one of our hospitals, five of our hospitals, et cetera? And is it a 1% difference? Is it a 10% difference? 
Can I, I uh, board member Lynch, are you just suggesting a technical correction to the language? I think it was intended to be a charge master cap, not specific. Uh, for my second, yes, I think member Walsh is referring to D. Okay. Yes. Oh, the Medicare Advantage. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And I, I don't know that we can answer that question, Tom, until after we've voted and these are standard budget conditions. Right? So because they're standard, I mean, I guess we'd have to understand. I think it's also a little tricky to understand that with critical access hospitals, given the cost based reimbursement and how that kind of happens after the fact. Okay, um, so I think what I'll do is I may wait on the motion on this, particularly since member Holmes is not here uh, right now and unable to be here. And it might make sense to bring this up Wednesday if that's okay with council and therapy. Go ahead, Elena. Can I add something? So in the rate decomposition, we had hospitals exclude Medicare Advantage from the commercial rate. So I think we should be fine, except in those cases where hospitals were unable to parse them out, which is a reporting challenge anyway, which is why we added language saying we would like to see all hospitals, Part G, be able to break these things out going forward in case it wasn't clear. I mean, we've had it in guidance for a couple of years now. I just don't think anyone, I don't think all hospitals have been able to implement it yet. So. Well, maybe I'm confused. I didn't assume that the rate decomposition would be attached to the budget order and thus flow through to negotiations. That is, that is how we analyze the commercial rate. Sure, but I think what determines whether or not it's a commercial plan is not the decomp, right? It's it's more, it's other stuff. I understand what you're saying. I yeah. think that your analysis takes this into consideration. What I'm thinking about is how then the order gets applied in the negotiations or in, uh, you know, anything else sort of legally moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, I... I would agree with, um, I would support this, Robin. I look through to the link, um, public data file from UVM and their budget submission that has Medicare Advantage um, reimbursements, and they're often you know, 102 or 104% of Medicare in their public document. Um, so, I could see a situation where if, for instance, a hospital got a negative rate that they would then have to lower the Medicare Advantage reimbursement below the Medicare rate, which um, would be challenging, I think, for hospitals. And um, and like you said, you know, I think that's not the intent of what we're doing here. So I, I'm supportive of this uh, specifying that this is not to be applied to Medicare Advantage plans. Which the NPR still is related to Medicare Advantage revenue. Any other board member discussion on this? Um, I'm going to hold the motion until um, Wednesday uh, so that member Holmes can review this and also so we can take some public comment on the standard budget conditions. And I see Ms. Champney has her hand raised. How are you? Hey, Chair Foster, um, for the record, Kelly Champney. I'm the Vice President of Contracting for the University Health Net of Vermont Health Network. Um, thank you for the time for their comment. I think member Lunge highlighted a concern uh, we have in terms of the, the technical um, terms here are very important to nail down. And uh, Member Lunge highlighted the charge master and charge increase, and particularly in regard to the definitions that were in slide 19 of last uh, the last meeting on Friday, and the language that's involved in letter B and C really conflate revenue and rate a number of times. And we're not on 
we're not clear, excuse me, as to how the board or the staff intends to implement, monitor, and really provide enough clarity for us to respond to in a robust public comment because these terms are being used interchangeably. For example, commercial growth rate or commercial growth is that in terms of revenue or rate. And then in C, both NPR are used and a rate cap, uh, which is undefined. So again, in terms of clarity, we're asking for the board and staff to further explain the process here, as it's really important to nail down the very um, terms that we're being expected to follow and how we're expected to work with our payers. Um, final comment is in B, the total commercial charge, and we pr uh, propose looking at the aggregate negotiated rate. We noted in our testimony at the hearing, and I believe how payers have also uh, classified how we negotiate. We negotiate with payers in aggregate. Some codes may change, for example, if we want to address lowering, lowering certain outpatient um, rates. They may go lower, and then we all balance it out. Payers also have brought lower rates or higher rates at time in service lines. So we want to be able to work with our payers on flexibilities, and we've had success in the past. So we just want to note, again, the importance allowing for aggregate negotiated rate increases instead of service by service. So thank you for your time. Thank you. And um, I'm going to talk to our staff after this meeting, and maybe there's a mechanism where you can suggest what you would like to see and would be uh, provide the clarity you're looking for um, to make sure we work with the insurers and the hospitals to make sure we have it right. So the intent is followed and clear. Any other public comment? And we'll take public comment on these budget conditions um, over the next couple of days. So please feel free to send it in via written format as well. I think that is all we have, seeing no other public comment on today's hearing and presentations. I will move that we adjourn. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Um, thank you very much, Michelle and staff, for all your hard work. And we can go off the record and we are adjourned. <laughs>